Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. We're gonna give it just another couple minutes as more uh, people start joining. We'll get started in just one minute. Looks like we've had some more people join us. We'll get started in just one more minute. Well, good morning. Um, thank you all so much for being here today for this presentation. My name is Caitlin Cron, and I'm a senior consultant at Public Consulting Group and the project manager for the OHA Behavioral Health Residential Plus Facility Study. Uh, we're so excited to share an overview of the study and findings with all of you. Uh, as we kick off, I want to go over just a couple of administrative items. So this meeting is being recorded and OHA will post the recording for future viewing and listening. Um, you do all have the option to come off of mute, but we ask that you remain on mute for the time being and hold your questions until the end of the presentation. There is a Q&A button either at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, depending on how you joined, um, that you can use to submit questions for PCG and OHA that we'll be going through with the available time remaining um, at the end of our presentation. Um, before PCG dives into this report, I want to hand it over to OHA Behavioral Health Director Ebony Clark to provide a welcome and introduction. Oh, can everyone hear me okay? We can, Ebony. Okay, great. Um, so just want to say that we are um, excited to be at this point in this juncture where uh, we have the opportunity to have PCG walk through um, the methodology, um, the findings, um, and the recommendations to really uh, serve as a, uh, a starting point and a foundation um, for us to really understand, you know, what is the current snapshot of our licensed residential all the way to acute care capacity for adults across the state of Oregon. Um, this is uh, critical and essential uh, as a key starting point so that then as we start to think about um, future capacity and as we're thinking about strategy and decisions, um, we'll have some core framing to center um, our decisions on. Uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what some of our next steps are on the OHA side. Um, but with that being that we have a little limited time, I'll hand it back to you, Caitlin, to um, begin walking through the study. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ebony. So to begin, we're going to provide an overview of the scope of work for this project. Um, at the direction of Governor Kotek, OHA was tasked with leading a new study to evaluate behavioral health facility capacity in Oregon. So PCG contracted with OHA in July 2023 to complete this study to assess behavioral health facility capacity and unmet need for mental health residential, substance use residential, and withdrawal management facilities in the state. The scope of this study included collecting data on the number and type of adult behavioral health facilities and their associated capacities and identifying gaps in the continuum conducting community engagement sessions with individuals across the state, reviewing available data and prioritizing facility types, developing a funding allocation methodology to inform capital funding requests and distribution processes, and developing a final recommendations report that communicates the work completed and planning recommendations. 
At the direction of OHA, the facility types on the right of our screen are included in the study. PCG and OHA acknowledge that this list does not encompass the entire care continuum in Oregon, but these are the facilities that PCG was directed to analyze as part of the study. In our final report, each of these facility types is explained in great and further detail. Next, we will discuss our data collection and analysis portion of this project. So PCG utilized multiple data sources and methods for this study, which include both quantitative data and qualitative data. At the direction of OHA, PCG created an inventory of the current facilities in Oregon within scope and their associated bed facilities or bed capacities in each of the seven trauma system areas across the state. Uh, trauma system areas are based on patient referral patterns, resources, and geography, and are defined by administrative rule. Additionally, each area has an area trauma advisory board, which is responsible for acting as a liaison between providers and the public, as well as participating in trauma system area planning. We collected data for this final report with March 2024 as our data cutoff date. This slide represents a snapshot of the current and planned bed capacity in Oregon. So overall, there are 4,887 licensed beds across Oregon for the facilities within our scope. As mentioned on the previous slide, um, for the final report, we did use data received um, up until March 2024 for the current capacity for the facilities. A more recent data set and more precise assessment of existing and anticipated capacity throughout the state resulted in the capacity counts as shown on the screen. It is important to note that this report should be viewed through a lens of a point in time um, based on the selective facilities within our scope. Now I'll pass it over to Phoebe Kelher to provide some community engagement highlights. Thanks, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Phoebe Kelleher. I was lucky enough to be able to lead the community partner engagement portion of the study. Um, to enhance our quantitative data, PCG collaborated with OHA to gather qualitative data through community partner engagement. This process prioritized capturing a couple of specific populations. We wanted to be sure to capture both rural and urban perspectives. Um, we wanted to engage with providers and recipients of culturally specific services. And we really wanted to obtain insights from individuals with lived experience accessing behavioral health and substance use services in Oregon. Next slide. Um, to achieve this, we conducted 32 key informant interviews, two focus groups with caregivers uh, of individuals with lived experience, and one with the Oregon Black, Brown, Indigenous Advocacy Coalition. We also conducted one listening session with tribal leadership. Um, we had the opportunity to hold some of these interviews in person and conducted some facility visits. So you can see on this slide here the list of representative categories, um, which we really did in an attempt to seek out as many perspectives as possible about the behavioral health system and specifically residential facilities. Um, you'll also notice that some of these are not necessarily providers or people specifically within residential facilities because really digging into the access and how the continuum works together was a huge part of our community engagement considerations. Uh, next slide. A uh, priority was placed on engaging with people with lived experience, including those who make up our peer workforce. Uh, these individuals have firsthand knowledge and their insights can provide a deep understanding that is difficult to capture through purely quantitative perspectives. Um, some of the considerations specifically with people with lived experience, we did provide $160 stipend that was distributed to all participants. Um, we also conducted a feedback loop. So a preliminary report of the study was released in January, 2024. This report was shared with community partners with lived experience, and we later engaged to provide feedback on the report. Uh, that feedback and additional contributions were included in our final report. Next slide. Um, since people with lived experience constituted nearly half of our key informant interviews, um, their unique perspectives highlighted some key areas for improvement. Um, this included staff training in more trauma-informed care, an emphasis on uh, enhancing the quality of services, um, and the need for inter integrating more evidence-based practices. Uh, people with lived experience, and as when we talk about key themes as a whole, we'll talk about this a lot, but did bring up the need to support um, community-based services outside of just residential facilities, um, including supportive housing. Uh, prevention services also came up quite often. Um, increased funding for prevention services, emphasizing um, meeting the basic needs of Oregonians, particularly housing, food, security, um, gambling prevention and treatment, uh, and a persp uh, perspectives from the criminal justice. 
um, involved people with lived experience includes, included facing unique challenges when accessing behavioral health services in the community, um, particularly upon leaving incarceration or needing uh, post-incarceration treatment. Criminal records often hindered access to programs and left individuals without essential resources to um, meet their needs for behavioral health and substance use services. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, many of the key themes that were just identified uh, with people with lived experience were also present across all of the respondent types. Overall, key themes from key informant interviews provided essential context for our recommendations regarding new residential facilities and the broader behavioral health continuum. Um, one significant theme was the need to address capacity and the quality of the workforce across the continuum. Um, additionally, for new residential facilities, there was a call to hone in and address wait times, enhance substance use services across the continuum of care, um, including outpatient services, and address the exclusionary criteria that prevents some of Oregon's most vulnerable residents from accessing services. Uh, when discussing expansion and funding priorities, respondents emphasize the importance of creating more culturally specific services, addressing complex needs such as co-occurring disorders, physical limitations, and utilizing models that are tailored to rural communities. Um, another crucial theme was the belief that developing more community-based systems, particularly in supportive housing, could offset the need for residential facilities, um, an increase in residential facilities through decreasing overall acuity of the population, um, and then also through uh, minimizing the length of stay that someone may need to access a residential facility. Um, I also wanna note that these are just the key themes that emerged out of, um, some, these are some of our more common themes that emerged out of the key informant interview process. Um, but I highly recommend that everybody review the report because there are so many other extremely important themes um, that may not be the uh, most common themes we heard, but are all really relevant when we consider um, how we want to invest in behavioral uh, residential facilities. Um, in addition to that, next slide, please. We also have very unique themes that were that came out of our focus groups for um, the OBIAC focus group. One of the biggest things that we heard about was uh, the one size fits all approach that we often see in uh, residential facilities that most treatment and care models are not created for black, brown and indigenous people. And they need to diversify that approach um, services and staff to better care for these groups. Uh, that also connects to lack of diverse providers and more diverse leadership needed. Um, a high level of experience of racism and stigma. Um, some of the suggested solutions to these would be support for smaller culturally specific organizations and grants for culturally specific groups. Next slide. In our caregivers with lived experience, um, caregivers noted long wait times. I did see a, a Q and A, and sorry, I can't access the Q and A from um, my screen, but. I saw that there was a question about defining long wait times. It was very like qualitative in the definition of long wait times. I think for people with lived experience, it was specific to how long they needed to wait to access services. Sometimes that could be months. Sometimes that could be uh, weeks of gap in between levels of care needed. Um, so there was not a, a specific quantitative measurement of long wait times, but this was also noted in our caregivers for lived experience um, focus group as well. Um, capacity issues, staff shortages, things that we have heard in other key themes throughout all of our respondents. Uh, and I think something that was most important um, to me when hearing from the caregivers with lived experience was this feeling of hopelessness, this feeling that even if we are able to access what we believe we need as the residential facility for the person that we're caregiving for, we often might not be met with a high level of quality of care, um, or that they might run into insurance issues or that feeling that they don't feel safe within the system. Um, and how can we strengthen that system to reduce hopelessness overall when accessing services and also being able to access services in the first place. Um, and lastly, we held a listening session with tribal leadership. Um, we asked some main questions like what are the greatest behavioral challenges and needs in your tribal community? Uh, what models of care could the state expand upon? Um, some of the key themes that emerged were prioritizing culturally specific tribal-based practices, including creating tribal-based models, encouraging a culturally specific peer workforce, um, and some of the suggestions that came up in building out a workforce included engaging already with uh, tribal and rural communities um, to encourage members of the tribes to be licensed in, in mental health treatment, um, to come back and serve their communities and create that continuity of care. Um, 
and to also consider what are some leading practices throughout other tribes in other areas of the United States, considering where they have seen uh, improvements in their behavioral health models. Um, I saw another question pop up, and uh, again, I'm so sorry because it pops away immediately, but the um, listening sessions, so our respondents for uh, community partner engagement, specific respondents are um, anonymous, but you can see the tribes that were represented in the group of the um, listening session in the uh, final report. Um, next slide, please. So um, as Caitlin mentioned, uh, the study focused on the population as a whole, and it did not analyze specific groups that access residential facilities in the state. Um, and I think that's why our community engagement was so important, because it highlighted several critical areas that require further consideration when planning new residential facilities, particularly in terms of who's able to access these facilities and addressing the needs of specifically vulnerable population. Um, engagement with community partners, particularly those with lived experience, underscored that it's imperative to prioritize the adaptability of facilities to meet these diverse needs. Um, and they really underscored the significance of strengthening the behavioral health continuum as a whole, um, and that community-based supports and health-related social needs, particularly in housing, could pave the way for uh, reduced acuity among individuals seeking services, shorten their length of stay, and ultimately offset our need for uh, residential facilities. Um, prioritizing the insights of these partners paved the way for uh, robust community-based paths to care. Um, and I also just want to mention on a personal note, as someone who conducted a lot of this engagement myself, um, it was incredible to see how many people were completely invested in improvements and seeing uh, real positive change in residential facilities. And I am so excited that we were able to include so many of those insights when we're considering how we're going to move forward uh, with residential facilities in Oregon. Um, and given that, I'll pass it off to Rhonda for forecasting. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Rhonda Kern Stralzer. I'm another um, senior behavioral health advisor on this team. And um, thank you for allowing us to present some of this information to you today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the forecasted behavioral health capacity needs. Um, so, the table that is displayed provides a picture of statewide capacity needs for facilities within the project scope. While there's no perfect way for finding the appropriate number of residential and inpatient beds in a given behavioral health system, PCG used state and national data, research findings, as well as surveys to identify mental health and SUD treatment bed capacity and needs. This measurement used um, determines bed capacity needed based on um, the needs of 100,000 people in a given population, or I should say per 100,000 people in a given population. The table shows what the current capacity is when you start looking from left to right. You have the calculated pending capacity and the total projected capacity by third quarter of 2025. Then you have the future bed capacity, which adds together the projected capacity by third quarter and the projected need for the total future bed capacity by each facility type, which is the second column from the right. Next slide. I'm going to be talking about the forecasted behavioral health costs associated with building out facilities beds in the state of Oregon. So this slide um, actually has uh, two graphs in it, and um, it actually shows the projected capital cost per facility based on average facility size and the projected capital costs And sorry, it just popped up on me. Um, I will answer that question in a minute. And the projected capital costs for the capacity needed in Oregon. After collecting um, and analyzing data, the average costs were determined by facility with the average number of beds for new and existing facilities to determine the average capital cost to build a new facility. We acknowledge in Considering the distribution of funding, any allocation towards building new residential facilities must correspond with aggressive and highly coordinated efforts. 
to address workforce development and capacity issues in already existing facilities and strengthen community-based crisis and outpatient services. Our engagement with community partners, particularly those with lived experience, underscores that it is imperative to prioritize the adaptability of facilities to meet the diverse needs of all Oregonians. This involves a thoughtful consideration of individuals with co-occurring disorders, the increasing acuity of those seeking behavioral health and substance use services, and the expansion of culturally specific services. Although the scope of this analysis is limited to the distribution of capital funding for new residential facilities, all work streams must be considered and coordinated to effectively expand behavioral health care across the state. Um, I will go back real quick. Um, the question was, why is there no increase in projected capacity for inpatient and OSH beds? Um, that is something that is you'll see in uh, a slide that Caitlin is going to address in the five year plan that she'll be talking about just shortly. And with that, I will pass it over to Caitlin. Thank you so much, Rhonda. So as Rhonda just mentioned, I'll be walking through the five year plan. So at the direction of OHA, PCG devised a five year plan for expanding behavioral health capacity in the state. Um, what this plan does is it it identifies capacity goals for each assessed bed type within our scope. Um, our roadmap for capacity planning outlines essential yearly milestones by bed type and trauma system area based on proportional distribution of state population defined by those trauma system areas um, for calendar year 25 through 29. Um, these milestones serve as a um, foundation for developing capacity to meet the needs of Oregonians considering various factors. Um, but ultimately, the comprehensive five-year plan is a guiding framework for critical decisions to be made related to capacity expansion and shaping the trajectory of behavioral health facility capacity in Oregon. Um, by establishing these target bed capacity increases in each trauma system area, the plan aims to address gaps in Oregon's statewide behavioral health infrastructure and specifically focuses on bridging disparities in all regions and facility types within scope. So this slide provides a snapshot of the five-year plan for trauma system area one. So we use um, trauma system area one as our example for this presentation. Uh, we broke out the bed capacity allocation by facility type and calendar year. So as you can see in the table, bed distribution is even across each year to provide a manageable yet attainable goal for each calendar year. For trauma system area one, you can see between 347 and 351 beds are needed per year to reach those goals. Again, the five-year plan strategically organizes the capacity building plans over a span of five years, aligning with state funding opportunities. This comprehensive plan serves as a guiding framework for critical decisions, particularly related to funding, which will shape the trajectory of behavioral health facility capacity in Oregon. Um, by establishing these target numbers, the plan aims to address gaps in the state's behavioral health infrastructure, specifically focusing on bridging disparities and access to specific bed types across those different trauma system areas. Um, these estimates serve to initiate discussions at the state and local level for further evaluation and planning based on the direction of need defined by bed and facility capacities. Uh, the total number of beds for the five-year plan for these facilities and their associated costs is noted on the screen. Um, though the plan is for five years, there are several kind of quick wins from this plan that we wanted to highlight. So in the first year of calendar year 25, the plan details adding 657 residential facility beds across the state of Oregon. Of those 657, 67 of those will benefit those seeking mental health residential services in RTFs, RTHs, and SRTFs. Um, also in that first year of those 657, 590 of those residential facility beds will see um, that seeks um, services will see those like SUD residential or withdrawal management service beds increase. Additionally, those um, 657 beds are distributed appropriately across the state to serve Oregonians in every trauma system area in the state. So every trauma system area will um, see an increase in beds with this five-year plan. And now I'll hand it over to Rhonda to discuss our proposed recommendations. We have a question, Caitlin, that came in. 
that says, did your analysis consider the financial sustainability of facilities with existing and pending capacity, example EBITDA, or the growth of private equity and its potential impact? Thank you so much for this question. This study really encompassed just capacity, so we purely looked at beds in these facilities. So it's licensed capacity for this um, particular study. However, that is like really great context, and some of those considerations came up in our community engagement sessions, but the study was focused purely on just capacity and number of beds. Thank you. And Rhonda, I'll pass it over to you for those recommendations. Thank you. So um, for proposed recommendations, evaluating the entire behavioral health continuum is a complex process that requires a comprehensive understanding of various factors that contribute to the delivery of effective care. This report analyzes only a portion of those facilities within the behavioral health continuum in Oregon, and our recommendations are based on data collected and analyzed as part of this study, coupled with feedback and input from community partners. With that being said, there are four key items that we have uh, provided recommendations for. The first one is care model and strategy. Second one's workforce development. Third is building additional facilities. And fourth is awareness, education, and engagement. So when we talk about care model and strategies, while Oregon has several pieces in place that make up a behavioral health continuum, um, one of the suggestions that we have made is developing a care model and strategy similar to a hub and spoke hub and spoke model to care for individuals within geographic regions and certainly supporting the majority of needs based on that geographic region. Um, workforce development. Certainly, um, most facilities, um, you know, are either understaffed or having difficulty um, in getting individuals to come work. Um, so building more facilities certainly could exacerbate the workforce challenges faced by existing facilities. And we also identified that as building new facilities, bed or capacity. You have to understand the uh, workforce that's currently in place, as well as potential challenges um, for those existing facilities, as well as new facilities. Additional facilities, when we talk about that, um, you know, one of the things that really looking at if you're going to expand the infrastructure of mental health and SUD is looking at those current facility capacities. Um, but also if the decisions made to build those out, looking at expanding capacities for various facility types for different individuals across the state. And those may be complex, forensic, different types of populations in which they would serve. And then lastly is um, that awareness, education, and engagement, certainly developing um, awareness, education, and development opportunities with community partners surrounding mental health and SUD services, um, specifically related to access, treatment options, opportunities, legislative updates, statistics, funding, um, creating websites, uh, streamlined information, um, opportunities to interact with, with um, different partners throughout uh, the system. And with that being said, um, you know, based on our time in Oregon and our final report, PCG would recommend further exploration of additional areas and behavioral health landscape to strengthen that community, that continuum. And with that being said, <clears throat> we've identified 12 different areas that really the state could further explore. Uh, youth population, geriatric population, those with complex needs, forensic population, staffing and workforce, crisis facilities, quality of care, housing and outpatient programs, analysis of insurance and payment types, operating costs, evaluation of public messaging, as well as developing a, an advisory committee. So with that being said, um, I will pass it back over to Caitlin to give the conclusion. Thank you so much, Rhonda. 
So in conclusion, it's important to note that this report should be viewed through the lens of a point in time based on the selected facilities within our scope. While the report is based on the current continuum of care, current population, capacities, rules, and regulations, it serves to initiate discussions at the state and local level to further um, evaluation and planning based on the direction of need defined by bed and facility capacities. Um, however, capacity needs should not be the sole focus when discussing the expansion of the behavioral health continuum. The broader behavioral health system encompasses more than just facility capacities. Um, it also includes the availability of those additional community programming, outpatient programs, um, staffing, housing, um, and other supportive services, all of which impact the actual utilization of facility capacity. Uh, these programs and facilities play a crucial role within the behavioral health continuum and significantly can influence those capacity needs. As Rhonda mentioned, evaluating the entire behavioral health care continuum is a complex process that requires a comprehensive understanding of the various factors that contribute to the delivery of effective care. Uh, this report analyzes a portion of the facilities within the behavioral health care continuum, and our recommendations are based on the data collected and analyzed as part of the study, coupled with uh, feedback and input from our community partners. And with that, I will pass it over to OHA to discuss some of their plans and next steps. Oh, one moment before we get to that, we have another question. Ebony, if we could go ahead and address that quickly. <laughs> the question is, when you review capacity, are you looking at a total capacity that is being actually used head um, or in a bed each night or looking at current capacity that is possible had a facility been fully staffed and each bed was used. Thanks so much, Rhonda. So um, OHA directed PCG to use license capacity. So we received license bed capacity um, counts from the state. However, um, we did ask this question in our provider survey that was administered in the fall um, about staffed um, and operational capacity, knowing that sometimes there's a difference. So those themes are noted in the final report. Ebony, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. You know, so, you know, what I want to just uh, close on before we open it up to any uh, remaining questions is that um, our plan moving forward, um, OHA uh, intends to use the study as a center point to really uh, guide um, our strategies, our prioritization, um our decisions um and and how we resource um dollars uh when we're thinking about um the residential and above levels of care um again we recognize that this is a point in time and um that there are so many uh variables and uh contingencies that influence also um the need um, and utilization of uh, these higher levels of care. And so, um, you know, just want to state that that is not lost. Um, and, and, and with that, you know, um, a lot of the focus really will initially center around how are we looking at um, supporting and expanding community-based levels of care. Um, in terms of just immediate next steps, you know, our job is to, you know, uh, take this, sit with this, digest it to um, really be able to then um, produce uh, a plan of action around um, where we're going to go in terms of um, the five year plan, five year recommendation, um, recognizing that, you know, um, that it took decades to get here. Um, and it's going to take a strategy that spans uh, multiple biennias to um, achieve um, the continuum of care that we're looking for. And, and so uh, before we step into any final questions, I want to thank PCG um, and the full team for um, their great work. Um, and also want to thank uh, my OHA team, um, specifically Sam DuPont, uh, John Collins, uh, Samantha Byers, and Krista Jones, and many more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ebony. 
Um, so with that, we'll now open it up for Q&A. Um, you can enter in your comments into the chat. There's also a Q&A function. Um, so whatever is easiest for you to enter in your chat. Um, we did receive one question in advance through the registration link regarding the needs of the aging population in behavioral health. Um, so while the scope of this study did not include an analysis on those specific populations, um, it was noted during our community engagement sessions, and those key themes are included in the final report. Um, additionally, we also included a deeper population analysis in our final report section on areas for further analysis. Um, considering all Oregonians impacted by the behavioral health system is incredibly important when considering strengthening the behavioral health facilities across the state. Um, so thank you so much for submitting that question. It looks like, Caitlin, we have two. We have another question that just came in and then someone has raised their hand. Um, I'll look at the question in the chat first. Will OHA continue making updates of the study publicly available as new information and assumptions are tested and changed? I can tell this was a significant effort. I hope it can continue to be refined and utilized. Ebony, would you like to field that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll say at the moment, um, you know, First and foremost, because we have limited resource, um, you know, we we have no plans at this moment to um, continue to update this specific study. Um, you know, as we uh, think of the future, we recognize, um, as it's been noted, that there are other critical uh, areas of our continuum of care that have to be um, evaluated and studied, and um, as we do that, you know, this study, this report will certainly be something um, that is always uh, offered um, as a um, critical element um, of information to be considered. But uh, the short answer is at this point in time, this is not um, uh, an evergreen study. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you so much for your question. Um, Rose, I see you have your hand raised. Hi, um, good to see everyone. You know, my focus is gambling addiction and I heard so little about um, gambling addiction. Uh, we're in crisis here in the United States, in the state of Oregon with gaming, with our young people on their phones and gambling addiction. Um, I now, as a compulsive gambler in long-term recovery, if I were still gambling, I could lay in my bed and lose the rent, the electric bill. I could lose everything and never have to get up out of my bed and, um, and I would still be destitute. Um, we really, really, as part of the behavioral health culture, need to take a look at the devastating impact that gambling and gaming addiction has on our youth and our adult population. So please, please include that. Um, I hear a lot of talk, it's a SAMHSA talk about, um, about substance use disorder. You know, I have a real attitude against that terminology, um, but I gamble at the same places where I buy my booze. And it goes hand in hand. They're not separate entities. They go hand in hand oftentimes. So I do want gambling addiction looked at uh, from uh, OHA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose, and thank you for your question and um, feedback. We did include residential gambling uh, facilities under the umbrella of residential um, SUD facilities, so it is included in the report. And um, Phoebe, are there any additional comments from community engagement section of the report that you'd like to highlight? Absolutely. I mean, gambling came up quite often in our community engagement, both in prevention and expansion of treatment services and, and levels of care needed. Um, and I think that something that we talked about throughout this report and that will Ebony had mentioned in, in her closing remarks as well is um, while this looks at capacity need as a whole and population as a whole, um, all of the specific services offered, population served, um, and levels of care have to be considered when there is decision making about residential facilities. Um, and so thank you, Rose, for your question, because I think that's that's really important in considering 
um, not only the, the quantity, but the quality of the services that Oregon will be offering. And may I add, there's only one inpatient residential program um, in the state of Oregon, and it has an eight bed capacity. Not enough, not good, not good. Thank you. And I want to add to this as well, um, Rose, you have exactly why in the report you will see that we have said um, this is a starting point and an opportunity to have discussions at the local and state level because, you know, you guys certainly know some of those needs. And that's why we did identify that throughout the report as well, is to help. This is a starting point, but having those conversations more locally and um, will help define what the true need of the state is. And you've identified that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, and it looks like uh, another Rose in the chat. Do you know um, how withdrawal management facilities are defined by OHA as far as ASAM classification? Ron, did you want to speak to how you um, describe the facilities with, uh, within the final report? Yes, we did um, look at OHA, of course, and the ASAM classification, and that is noted within the report based on clinical and withdrawal management beds. And we we did def look at those and identify those within the report. However, the final numbers that we identified um, are just withdrawal management. Again, going back to what you know, we, I was just talking with Rose about that at the local level and having those conversations with individuals, um, you know, you guys will be able to help define and determine what types of beds are going to be needed and which a same classification you guys would need um, in your area. So. And then Thank I think we have question. one more. Um, can you describe the CAS method used in the study? Are there supplementary tables that break down the prevalence estimates for SUD diagnosis? Uh, Rhonda, do you want to speak to how you utilize CAS for um, capacity needed for SUD residential and withdrawal management? Yeah, so there is um, some other tables as well as a breakdown of how the SUD uh, and the CAS scores are related and how we came about with that. Um, we partnered with um, JG Research on that, and they actually did the actual um, methods and calculation on that piece. We took those numbers um, and, you know, identified the total number of beds based on SUD diagnosis. So, yes, that is in there, as well as um, kind of that method and, and JG Research and how we utilize that. Are there any additional questions for us? Well, I, I just want to again, um, thanks, you know, thank PCG for um, your um, robust and thoughtful uh, report. And, um, you know, again, I also want to thank you know, all of the um, individuals, providers, and community members that also helped inform the work. So with that, I think we're at time and appreciate everyone joining. So thank you. Thank you all so, so much. And um, just an additional thank you from um, to echo uh, Ebony sentiments. And thank you to everyone who contributed to our analysis and study. Um, we worked with so many wonderful members of the community and their insights and feedback were crucial to developing our report. So thank you all so much for your time um, to our dedication to our shared goals. So thanks for attending today and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.